Hi guys. This is a video on the overview of chapter 14. This is where we start the managerial side of the book. So this chapter is really based on the concepts and principles that we will use really for the rest of the semester. So first of all, Let's talk about the purpose, nature of, and role of ethics in managerial accounting. So managerial accounting is to provide information for managers to make decisions. I have mentioned this in the orientation. I'm mentioning it now. This is really, really the important concept of why managerial accounting exists. And the focus is, of course, on what makes sense for the individual company. So we have the financial accounting system that generates information that we can use, but the purpose then of managerial accounting is to take that information and plan future operations. What new products, new markets, new factories, new stores, whatever it is we're talking about, we can plan and then compare our plan to what actually happened. So the whole idea of being a manager or the management process is to plan and then direct people or tell them what to do, control what they do by comparing and then evaluate what's happened through feedback loops. So this is the process that we can use for vir virtually any task that we want to manage. Plan, direct, control, evaluate. So the difference between financial and managerial accounting is the internal versus external focus. With financial accounting, we're trying to provide third parties, outsiders, investors, creditors, bankers, anybody that needs information as opposed to managerial accounting, which is supplying internal people, employees of the company, management with information so they can make decisions. The financial accounting world focuses around generally accepted accounting principles or GAAP. Managerial accounting, we don't care about GAAP. We are just truly providing information for uh, making decisions. Using an example, and I always use um, food in my examples, you can probably figure out why. But if you were the manager of a El Pollo Loco, for example, and you're trying to control the food costs, the chicken costs, the tortilla costs, the paper costs, and the labor costs, you couldn't care less about general accepted accounting principles. You want to know is what's the price of chickens per pound, how much of, did you use, how much went to waste, and um, so that information is available through the accounting records, but it has nothing to do with generally accepted accounting principles. We need to be quick with this information from a managerial standpoint, because if it takes too long for us to provide information, by then it's too late. Decisions can't be made uh, with information that's two or three or four months old. So that's why this information has to be out very, very quickly. In some cases, it's out uh, within a day or two. Uh, I heard a story once about the president of and CEO of American Airlines. Every single day, he wanted to know how many empty seats there were on American Airlines flights. So that information came to him every single morning when he walked into his office. He could see um, how many planes flew with empty seats and how many empty seats there were. Makes sense because obviously an empty seat on an airplane is lost revenue. <clears throat> but you can also see that that's, number one, isn't even financial information, it's, um, it's operational information, and it uh, has nothing to do with general accepted accounting principles. So the information is more summarized in financial accounting, um, when we pro provide financial statements, if we were Nordstrom's, we're going to provide information to the investment community for the whole organization, 
not just individual stores. But if I were the manager of a Nordstrom's at the Cerritos Mall, for example, um, I don't care about what's happening at other stores. I care about what's happening in my store. And so uh, it can be very detailed and, and shows uh, and, and individualized to the people that are um, need the information. And then uh, all of financial accounting is very monetary or money oriented, financial oriented, but managerial accounting information can be uh, monetary, but as my example with American Airlines, it could be also non-monetary. As far as ethics in managerial accounting, we're trying to make sure as accountants that the information we provide is, is uh, reliable and accurate that we're protecting assets of the organization, that people are following policies that we've developed in the company, and that they're operating efficiently. That is the, the purpose of, of what we're trying to do. There are different types of career paths that you could use if you wanted to go into managerial accounting, but primarily you're going to be working in internally to the organization to, to gather this information and provide it to uh, the management. So let's talk for a little bit about the different types of costs and how they behave and how we use them. So the first thing that we need to think about is whether something is a fixed or variable cost. A fixed cost stays the same over different levels of production. In other words, if we're in the business of making skateboards, the rent on our factory is going to be a fixed cost. No matter whether we make 5,000 skateboards or 10,000 skateboards, the rent is going to be the same. But variable cost is the cost that goes up and down as we make more or less. And so if we're making skateboards, we need more decks, more wheels, more trucks. Uh, if we make more or less, so that is a variable cost. The, dire the direct labor cost to put together the skateboards is going to be a variable cost because we're going to have to spend more on labor if we make more skateboards than if we make less skateboards. <clears throat> Next, we can talk about direct versus indirect, and we're going to be talking more about this in later chapters, but just to kind of introduce the topic, Direct costs are something that is traceable directly to a particular cost object. For example, a direct cost to making a skateboard would be the direct materials that go into it, the direct labor to put it together, and uh, indirect costs are a little more difficult, uh, like, for example, uh, maintenance on the factory or um, maybe a supervisor. Supervisor is supervising skateboards, scooters, bicycles, whatever other things we make. So that would be a, a, a cost that we would allocate based on some basis of allocation. So our three primary costs when we're a manufacturer is direct labor, direct material, and factory overhead or manufacturing overhead. <clears throat> these are called product costs and these end up in cost of goods sold. So we can identify these three categories in um, when we uh, incur these. I have posted a video for making baseballs where we can identify what is the labor, what is the materials, and what is the overhead that goes into making baseballs. So this is above the gross profit line, if you want to think about it in financial accounting stand, uh, uh, terms. Period costs are costs that are below gross profit. And those are selling, marketing, advertising, sales salaries, that kind of thing, and administrative. The accountants, the lawyers, uh, the payroll, the human resource people, they're all would be considered administrative costs. So they're not really related to the manufacturing of the product, but they are administering the whole company.
So these product costs are going to go into cost of goods sold. And of course, we have to capitalize the costs of products and then assign the ones that got sold to cost of goods sold and the ones that didn't get sold into merchandise inventory. And we're going to have three different inventory accounts in this chapter and in, in subsequent chapters, raw materials, work in process, and finished goods. So as things flow through, we get those costs assigned to the different accounts. So let's talk about these three types of product costs. Material costs, direct materials, are things that we need in order to make the product. In my skateboard example, again, it's all of the things that go into making the skateboard. If we're making a piece of furniture, a chair, it would be the wood, the fabric, the foam, uh, the hardware, anything that goes into the actual manufacturing of the uh, piece of furniture. Direct labor. Direct labor is the people that are putting the thing together, whether it's the people that are screwing the, the, the trucks and assembling the, the wheels onto the deck of the skateboard, or if we're making uh, furniture, if we're making a chair, we have people that are cutting the lumber into the right sizes to make the chair. We have people that are sanding it and doing it or doing whatever needs to be done to assemble it. And then uh, we, are, we have people that are finishing it with either paint or stain or something like that. Uh, in order to, and then packaging it to be shipped to a customer. So everything that involves people putting their hands on the actual product, we would consider direct labor. And then the last category is factory overhead. Factory overhead is a little more difficult because it's everything that encompasses the manu manufacturing process. We're talking about people in the factory, like supervisors, like maintenance people, like the rent, the property taxes, anything that's related to the actual factory um, uh, inspectors, people that come in and inspect products on a periodic basis. Those would all be people that are considered factory overhead or indirect labor. Indirect labor is a component of factory overhead, but then we have electricity, we have uh, water costs, uh, whatever other utilities there might be, and um, again, uh, anything that keeps the factory running would be considered a factory overhead if it's not a direct material or if it's not a direct labor. So we can categorize these three things into direct materials, direct labor being what we call prime costs, and direct labor and manufacturing overhead as conversion cost. Think of the conversion cost as the cost associated with converting the direct materials into the finished product. Non-manufacturing costs are what we call period costs, selling administrative expenses, and they aren't part of the cost of goods sold. These are, the again, the accountants, the lawyers, the salespeople, the people that are outside the actual manufacturing process of the, um, of the organization. So as I mentioned a minute ago, we're going to have three different inventory accounts in a manufacturing environment. We're going to have raw materials, work in process, and finished goods. We will be focused on the work in process account. The raw materials, finished goods is fairly straightforward. Raw materials, we buy lumber, we buy rubber, we buy whatever hardware we may need, and it just comes in, we put it on the shelf until we need it. So the cost associated with that is what we paid for it, plus any freight, or other, other um, uh, conversion costs that we might have if we need somebody to do something to it before it gets to us. But once we get the product, the raw materials in-house, it just goes on the shelf into this raw materials account. Finished goods 
is straightforward. Once a, a product is finished, it goes on the shelf in, in the finished goods warehouse, and all of the costs that are associated with manufacturing that become part of the cost of that finished goods inventory. So the, the, the part we're going to focus on is this work in process. As these three product costs come in, direct materials, direct labor, and factory overhead, we then convert them into the product and at the end we transfer them out into the finished goods inventory uh, in total as a bulk of 5,000 units or 100 units or whatever it is that we completed. These are asset accounts. They go up with the debit and down with a credit. And We'll do some problems here uh, later on that illustrate that. <clears throat> so that's it for this particular video. This is just an, a quick overview of how these costs work and what they are. I will uh, stop the video there and um, I will see you next time. Thanks for listening.